Resource Watch is brought to you in association with Tebe Investment Corporation. price is top of mind in the resources space. It reached $116 a barrel with supply concerns coming out of Iraq. Investors are worried that Islamic militants threatening to take control of northern Iraq could extend its reach to the south and cripple oil production in OPEC's second largest exporter. This week, fighting shut down the country's biggest oil refinery. This is Resource Watch and we'll be looking at the global repercussions of a high oil price. I'm Nozi Pomban. Let's kick off with a look at stories making headlines. There's still no end in sight for South Africa's costly 21-week platinum strike. Miners Lonman, Angloplat and Impala say Union Amku has added new demands beyond their earlier agreement in principle. The producers say the new demands amount to an additional 1 billion rand, which they cannot afford. Engagement with Amku is ongoing. South Africa's energy sector is set for a shake-up which will see nuclear and shale gas playing an important part in the energy mix. President Jacob Zuma says the country's energy security is a key priority, with a need for a sustainable mix which would include coal, solar, wind, hydro, gas and the fast-tracking of nuclear energy generation. And gold buyers and sellers across the market will hold a discussion next month to explore ways to reform or replace London's global price benchmark known as the FIX. This was announced by the World Gold Council and comes as gold and silver fixes, along with other commodity benchmarks, face increased scrutiny by regulators in Europe and the US. It's no surprise that the latest conflict in Iraq, which just happens to produce nearly 3 million barrels of oil per day, 80% of which is exported, has sent jitters across the world. Today I'm joined by Bevan Jones, he's the Chief Executive Officer at Tebe Resource Incubator. Bevan, lovely to have you. Hi. Let's start off with some of the, the domestic pressures that are uh, causing Iraq to be in a space where they are impacting on the oil price. So I think what you're seeing is is the north of the country is obviously being um, e e exposed at the moment. Um, you're seeing the the the, the, the terrorist groups, mm -hmm. etc., having taken over the Baija refinery, which is up in the north. Now Iraq produces two crude oil grades. One is one is Kirkuk, which comes from the northeast region, and of the three million barrels a day that you talked about. Mm -hmm. The supplies have actually stopped since March of yeah. the cook, cook grade, but that's about mo possibly 0.5, if that. Um, the other is Basra Light, which comes out of the south of the country, near, near Basra, and that's where most of I Iraq's oil is exported. Now, of course, those supplies haven't been affected, and those, are, those fields are owned by the, the majors as well as the, the SOMA, which is the state oil company. And so on the markets, we're seeing the oil price at the highest levels that we've seen in 2014. How much further are we likely to see this trend continue? Well, I think, I think the markets have, have baked in a, a lot of what's happened over the last week. We saw last Monday and Thursday with the, with the big price moves. I think that th th there's fear out there. There's fear that what's happened in the north could spread to the south yeah. and could start to affect the Basra oil, oil supplies. Mm. Um, but again, what we're seeing is, is we're, we're now seeing engagement with Iran being far tracked by the UK and by US governments and that could actually lead to a bit of a bearish scenario if for instance sanctions on Iran were, were lifted and we saw more supply com coming out of Iran. Iran obviously being quite key in the region to try and help stabilize mm. the, that area. But when you've touched on one of the, the, the options and Iran being one of them, what about other oil producing countries? I know Saudi Arabia could likely uh, buffer some of that supply. That's right. So Saudi obviously produces uh, pr about a third of the, of the world, world's oil supply at the moment. Um, and, and really being the major producer in, in OPEC. Saudi is, it has picked up supply recently to counter some of the, the losses uh, out of Libya. There's less oil coming out of Libya as well. And obviously Saudi is watching the situation quite closely. If they feel they need to step up production mm. to offset any losses coming out of Iraq, they'll, they'll do that. Is Libya a real player? Could Libya really make a difference in this particular scenario? No, I think, I mean, Libya is one of the, one of the key oil producing uh, members in OPEC and in, in the region. Um, Iraq 
obviously a major producer, but again, as we've said, most of the supply coming out of the south. Yeah. Let's bring it back home and let's talk about implications for South Africa and in particular for consumers who are watching the p petrol price like, like a hawk. Sure. So obviously, I mean, our, our petrol price is impacted by the, the basic fuel price, which looks at the, 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 the market prices for things like diesel and petrol in Singapore, in the Arab Gulf. And of course, these, these market prices are influenced by the Brent oil price. So as Brent oil rallies, you're seeing uh, diesel and, and petrol rallying as well. So obviously we're going to feel that impact in, in, in the dollar terms and we're also feeling the impact from the, ra from the weakening of the rand against the dollar. Mm. So we will see petrol price increases coming through. Unfortunately Brent is, is, is exposed because as the price of Basra Light for instance or the price of Saharan blend out of the Middle East, as those prices rally, Brent prices will rally as well, just in sympathy etc. Mm. And, and just earlier we were hearing that the President in the State of the Nation are just focusing a lot of attention on the energy mix in South Africa, touching on shale gas and nuclear. But what options does this open up for consumers um, in light of the fact that we're likely to see prices tick up? So the one thing South Africa obviously has uh, a, a, an issue with is that we import all of our crude oil and we import all of our refined products. Most of those come through Durban. Um, we have the refineries in Durban, the engine refinery and the SAPREF refinery, which is the Shell and, and BP refinery. Um, and, and yes, we're very exposed to international prices. And for our balance of payments, it's not fantastic either because we're importing these expensive refined products. So one thing that would really be useful for South Africa is to develop a biofuel sector. Mm -hmm where we can look at alternative alternative fuels coming into biodiesel and, and bioethanol and there's certainly a lot of local opportunities that need to be developed. Yep. Tebe is quite involved in, in, yep. in some of those um, and, 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 and looking at uh, alternative sources of energy. But there's yeah. been a lot of talk about biofuels uh, in South Africa and, and something that doesn't seem to be new right now. Being an insider in terms of the industry, let's talk about some of the prospects for the industry. Is the legislation uh, enabling, is it something that's a real possibility? I think the legislation is enabling. It's it's just obviously there are huge issues. There are issues around blending. There's issues around the transport infrastructure. The same thing when you look at gas or shale gas. We, we, we really need to develop an infrastructure to enable the distribution of natural gas, etc. Natural gas going for power generation or natural gas going into compressed natural mm. gas for or, or liquefied natural gas for, for fuel. I mean, you're already seeing a lot of taxis driving with LNG, natural gas um, uh, at the moment. So it's, it's certainly, um, once the supply is there, the end users, the motorists, will, will certainly take it, especially if, it's, if it offers a cheaper alternative. And we have those opportunities and we need to develop what them. What about opportunities outside of South Africa's borders? Are we seeing Africa coming to the fore in terms of exploration, granting of licenses to really bring some of that uh, gas into market? Both gas and oil. So, mm. so, so we're seeing a lot of um, excitement. Africa's really seen as the last frontier in terms of oil and, and gas exploration. So, so what keeps the chief executives of, of Shell and BP up at night is finding new reserves to replace their reserves that they're depleting. So you're looking at places like Namibia, which is seeing a lot of offshore interest in the Orange River Basin. Mm. You're seeing even offshore in the wild coast, offshore Durban, uh, Exxon Mobil coming in with, lo with local companies to explore for oil offshore. Onshore, you're obviously seeing the, the, the shale gas and, and, and coal bed methane, etc., biogenic gas in the Free State gold mines. All of these gas opportunities are being developed at the moment. Mm. And the legislation is enabling. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's quite punitive in, in that government is seeking to take a 20% free carry yeah. and then up to an 80% negotiated buy-in at, at a market rate. But still, the, 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 that's, you know, the, the, the market is, is seeing that as a, as a positive thing, that government is at least in, engaging and providing a framework to develop this. So we are seeing Africa develop. Mozambique, certainly, we're seeing the, the, the Pande Tamani gas fields being developed and further north as you go up to Pemba. Mozambique has huge onshore mm. gas reserves. I mean, if we turn quickly to the east of the continent, in particular Kenya, the concern has always been that uh, these fines are not viable to bring to market. How big is this concern? Is it an isolated Kenyan problem or are the oil and gas reserves in Africa under big question mark because they're not feasible? I think 
the, 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 they're different types of plays in, in, in terms of uh, the, the, the types of reserves that are being found. You're seeing oil reserves coming from the, the Rift Valley, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and people didn't think there was oil there. Now they do believe there's oil there. The f th th these fields are never going to be as big as the Saudi fields, etc. Um, but they are viable. Um, it's just that the cost of production is obviously scaling up. Yeah. So that means obviously that the cost of oil worldwide is, is slowly but surely going up because these, it's getting more and more expensive to find. What can we expect uh, as an outplay in the global markets right now? Well, we've seen Brent and, and, and the, the key market prices obviously rally on, on this news. Um, volatility in, in terms of implied volatility in, so from the traded options market has certainly shot up. I mean, we've seen that push up to sort of 40%. Historical volatility is still tracking at about 30%. But we, we're certainly seeing people pricing the, the, the fear into the market at, mm -hmm. the, at the moment. Um, we, we're seeing Brent at about 115, 116. It could, it could rally to 130 if something did happen to, to break out. But again, whether that happens or not, I, yeah, it's, it's anyone's guess. It's anyone's guess. Uh, that's according to the Chief Executive Officer of Tebe Resource Incubator, Bevan Jones. Thank you, Mike, so much for making the time to join us.